everyone. So we're going to do it a bit differently this time. Uh, I'm just going to speak over PowerPoint. Um, so today we're covering the late Epipaleolithic. In Southwest Asia we call it the Natufian, which stretches from um, 13,000 to 9,500 BCE. So let's get into it. The late Epipaleolithic, uh, the Natufians, as I said, 13,000 uh, to 9,500 BCE. The late Epipaleolithic we refer to as the Natufian. So the term of uh, like the term Natufian is coined by Dorothy Garrett uh, after her excavations at the Shukpa Cave and the um, Elwad Terrace. So. Um, she found microliths that identify with the European Mesolithic, um, which is the corresponding culture in Europe. And then the culture was not known from this region uh, previously. And um, the reason for the name of the Natufian is the sites were very close to the Wadian Natuf. And this culture is best attested in the Levant, and that's why um, it's only going to be very short on the Sacros Mountains. Um, and the archaeological data we have from the Harifian culture uh, in the Negev is very limited. So uh, the Natufian is uh, divided into two sub-periods. So we have the early and the late Natufian. And the early Natufian, it coincides with the Buling Elorul interstadial, which we also spoke about last time. So hopefully you can either remember or you can go back if you want to learn more about that. I covered it um, there. And that's the uh, cold and arid climate that uh, turns into wetter and more warm climates. And then you have the uh, late Natufian, which appears a bit before the Younger Dryas, and the Younger Dryas is a period of 1300 years where the climate it starts turning colder and more arid again. So we have, uh, as I did last time, uh, going to cover the toolkits of the Natufian, and this is the early Natufian. So you have geometric micro uh, microliths, uh, broad bladelets, scrapers and sickle blades. If you look at the um, the PDF I uploaded last week, uh, some of them are um, mentioned there. So from um, microware studies, uh, it's been found that the microliths were hafted uh, as composite arrowheads. So there's a difference in which kind of climate and um, geography, um, what kind of things are found there. So in forests and coastal sites, you have a higher amount of sickle blades and flint tools than the geometric microliths, uh, which suggests a higher level of plant gathering. And you also have a higher amount of bone tools. Um, you have awls uh, and points for sewing and weaving, <laughs> and burnishes and spatula for skin working and plain and barbed points for hunting in gorges and hooks for fishing and sickle hafts. Then at the steppe sites, um, you have a higher amount of geometric microliths than you have of um, sickle blades and flint tools. Um, and at some of the steppe sites, uh, it consists mainly of geometric microliths and at others, it's uh, mainly scrapers and denticulate. And most often these are used for carcass processing and skinning animals. Um, so yeah, moving on with the toolkits of the early Natufian, um, you have grinding equipment and those are found at all kinds of Natufian sites. And they're especially found at main settlements. You have portable mortars, bowels, querns, slabs, grooved stones and pestles. And then you also have cupstones or bedrock mortars. And these are carved into stone, like mm, in the bedrock. So they're staying there. Um, <laughs> so they're not portable. And the bedrock mortars, um, they can be up to a meter deep. And they're worn right through and has been repaired with flint cores. So they've been used over and over. Um, some of the key, key sites of the Natufian is the Shukpa Cave in Palestine, which is... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
where the whole thing started with the Natufian, um, for uh, for us at least. Then you ha have Ein Malaha, uh, which is also called Einan, uh, Einan in Israel. You have Ein Gev in Israel. Then you have Tel Abu Huraira in Syria, Shubeka in Jordan, Jericho in Palestine, Nahaloren in Israel, Murebat in Murebet, Murebet in Syria, and Wadi Hamme in Jordan. Um, so just to uh, cover what the Natufian sites are and what they're all about, the core area, as I said, is the Levant. And the original theory is that the Natufian culture began in Israel and then it spread out. But now we know that this might not be true. Sites such as Shubeka, which we will talk about later, are challenging this theory. So the early Natufians, they preferred the Levantine corridor between the uplands and lowlands. And they had open-air campsites and caves. And the campsites were either seasonal for hunting or they were set in sedentary um, and the Natufian uh, is has more sedentary architecture than we saw before so these um, semi-sedentary settlements they were built in stone so they lasted and approximately uh, 200 sites are found in the core area but only 10 have this uh, before mentioned architecture so one of the key sites are is uh, Tel Abu Huraira, um, which is uh, located on the present-day uh, Syrian steppe. And one of the largest assemblages we have of archaeobotanical remains is from Tel Abu Huraira. So archaeobotanical remains are not very common in this uh, to find in this period. Um, the plant remains indicate that spring and summer in the middle Euphrates were moister than it is today. And the inhabitants of Abu Huraira, they gathered wild acorn and wild rye. So the younger dryers um, in uh, this area um, at Abu Huraira um, showed a decline in tree fruits, asphodels and cereals. Um, and they need, because they need a hotter and wetter climate than the younger dryers provided. And in the Holocene, uh, which is the period after, um, the warmer and wetter climate returned. And now the park with London cereals, they were allowed to cross uh, the region again, as far as to the south in Sacros. Uh, another key site is Ein Malaha. Um, and here you have uh, architecture that consists of foot, stone footings. They are mainly circular oval. Um, they have post holes, uh, which indicates that you have wooden posts supporting simple su superstructures of timber and thatch above the stone footings. Um, so mortars and pestles were found inside of the structures. Um, and there's the structure 26, which has a storage bin. And these are not normal. They have only been found in very few sites, uh, the storage bin. And structure 29 has a hearth. Uh, inside the structure um, or have several actually and externally you have a group burial um, group burials around the settlement structures are normal for this period and we'll talk about that more later <laughs> um, and here's a photo of the Ein Malaha uh, with the mentioned structures 26 and 29 another key site is Shubeka um, it is a very recently um, a site in the sense that excavation started a few years back um, and um, so some of the other sites we just covered were excavated 20 30 years ago um, so it was inhabited during the early and late Natufian and Shubeka 6 uh, have structures from the pre pottery Neolithic A which is the period coming after um, so stro stone structures, burials, and the typical toolkits and fauna remains of the Natufian have been found here. But Shubeka is probably best known uh, right now for the earliest physical evidence of bread. So uh, plant remains were processed to become flatbread, and it was found in a fire pit at Shubeka 6. It was dated to 12,400 BCE, which is 4,000 years before the domestication of cereals. And, the, uh, and it was made from wild barley, einkorn and oats. 
um, continuing with Shubeka, um, well, so making bread was a lengthy process, more than it is today. So you have to gather the cereals, then you have to ground them, sieve them, work the dough, and then bake them, and that's a um, time process, um, time consuming uh, thing to do also. Um, and a lot of the work, um, oh, it was a lot of work for a very small um, uh, outcome compared to going fishing, hunting of large mammals, game and gathering of plants. But bread can also be a very easy food source to bring on hunting trips. You can either uh, bake it before you leave or um, you can have grounded um, cereals with you. Uh, or sieved cereals and they can be brought along and then you can mix them with a bit of water and then you can bake them and what was found also at Shubeka was tens of thousands of charred plant remains um, they were preserved in the ashes settlement of the fire pit where the bread was found and as I said earlier plant remains are not coming from this period so this was a major discovery so, in general, the faunal assemblage of the Natufian uh, is dominated by gazelles. Uh, you find them at nearly, um, or it's dominated, dominating at nearly all of the Natufian sites. So between 67 and 87 percent of the assemblage consists of gazelle. And gazelles in the Jordan Valley might have been hunted in organized communal game drives. Uh, so you used uh, fire to stampede the um, herds into netted enclosures. And this theory builds on the small game in the sample uh, fox and hare. So these animals are very fast and hard to catch, uh, and nets would have made this a lot easier. And stone kites in the eastern desert in Jordan, they have been used for hunting since the Upper Paleolithic. And this uh, could um, help you have these mass killings of animals. And uh, here is a photo of a um, faunal as, uh, no, <laughs> stone kite. Um, this is, um, as you can see, there's some um, roads kind of leading into it. And here you have the kite or the area where you would lead the animals into. Um, so th they are very visible from space and you can easily and clearly see them on Google Maps. And this is uh, actually from Google, Google Maps. I just made a took a screen grab of it. So yeah. Um, and last about the faunal assemblage is the and donkey and tortoise are in the sample too, but tortoise is very easy to catch, but there's not a lot of meat on it. So, so the early Natufian burials, uh, there's an indication of varied treatment of the dead, um, and group burials of adults, children, and infants are very normal. They're especially found buried under the floors of structures, but also found outside of structures, um, so nearby them. And they're either um, buried um, extended or in a flexed position, where you have the knees up to the chin lying on the side. And the composition and the location of the burials, family or households are now a residential unit. Um, So at Abu Huraira, um, the locus of food storage and the preparation and consumption are happening inside of the structures, so in households. And this is in contrast to camps like Ohalo 2, which is earlier, we covered that in the last lecture, and communal herds are outside the dwellings there. So um, there is a status difference, uh, it could seem, between or within burial clusters. Uh, so families might have been members of a subgroup, uh, such as a clan. And some were buried with little to no ornamentation, others had a variety of bracelets, necklaces and garters, which could be made of canine teeth, deer phalanges or dentalium shell. So we have a few special burials from the early Natufian. At El Wad in Ain Mahlaha, they each had an individual who had uh, elaborate dentalium headdresses with them. And at the Rakefet, Okay, fits cave in Mount Carmel in Israel. There were two individuals that were who were buried on a bed of flowers, and dozens of impressions of different plant species were found under the human skeletons. So this is uh, evidence of uh, the earliest uh, 
use of flower beds by humans. We have a potential one with Neanderthals. Um, so this is the first for Homo sapiens, it seems. Uh, so in uh, the early Natufian, the art is uh, not known for large-scale art. So like, you know, in Europe we have these big cave paintings, but they do not exist um, in, uh, in the Middle East, basically. Um, instead, you have decorated, decorated bone work and a lot of utilitarian um, objects, they were decorated. And items of personal grooming and ornaments uh, was decorated too. And then we go to late Natufian. So it coinc uh, coincides with the Younger Dryas, as I said earlier, it's the return of a cooler climate um, and people had to adapt to these new conditions and cereal actually became more sparse. Um, this is um, this meant uh, that uh, the people had some uh, responses to this which were kind of different um, some moved and some diversified the subsistence system and some intensified it. And overall this meant a poorer diet and declining health. And Abu Huraira uh, was actually abandoned due to the retreat of woodlands and cereals. Um, so uh, Asrak and El uh two sites in the Steppe region, they were also abandoned. Um, in the Negev and the Sinai, they actually broadened their subsistence diet. Um, and in the Levantine Corridor, this would have been where the pressure uh, was the worst. Uh, it is the primary zone of settlements for the Natufians. So this meant scarce of food, uh, which could lead to a more competitive and unfriendly relationship between the groups there. Um, responses to the change in climate uh, meant that there was an intensification of hunting of gazelle. And then you have a um, rise in microliths, which usually indicates uh, an increase in a diet more dependent on hunting and meat. But from skeletal studies, uh, it has been found that the populations in the Levantine Corridor actually ate more cereal than before. So uh, the scarcity of cereals, a theory is that this led to domestication of cereals. Um, because, you know, if you have, uh, if there's not a lot of round, if you can figure out how to make more by planting them, that would, uh, yeah, give you more plants or more cereal. So the best places for cereals would have been in the lowland alluvial soils, um, as we know it in the Jordan Valley. And one such site is Jericho, and Jericho was uh, first inhabited in the late Natufian. Um, Jericho is in um, in Palestine, but the conditions for cereals they would have been good, but it would also have been a lot of work to grow them there. So the ground would have to be prepared, seeds had to be transplanted, competitor plants would have to be weeded out, etc. And we call this horticulture and not agriculture. And then we go to late Natufian burials. So they change the customs of burials from the early to the late Natufian. You have single interments that are more common and are found in cemeteries instead of in the houses. And then you have detached human skulls. They have been found at Ein Mahalaha, Shukba and Nahaloren. And they are found outside the burials, so they have been removed uh, from the burial at one point. And it's a precursor to the skull cult, or ancestor cult, which uh, begins in the pre-pottery Neolithic A, with earliest evidence from Jericho. And we will cover this in, in lengthy detail uh, next week. Uh, ochre has also been found in some burials, which uh, makes sense when we look at groundstone tools where ochre residue has been found and the burial suggests a growing concern with rank and prestige there is an increase in, in exchange network over long distances so you have shells from the mediterranean the sea of galilee and the red sea um, and these could be interpreted as symbols of prestige because they had to travel a long way to get there and the late Natufian community seems to have shifted from kin base to more focused on positions of status and systems of decision making. So you go from your family to like ranking is more important. And the special burials we know from the late Natufian is a shaman burial from Hilason Taktib. Taktib? 
cave. Uh, a woman uh, was buried there, or assumed a woman, um, and it's dated to 10,000 BCE. Uh, she was buried inside this cave with a rich assemblage of um, especially animal remains, um, a large number of tortoise shells, 50 or so. There is also a form of a wild boar, an eagle wing bone, marten skull, a wild cow's tail, fragment of basalt bowl, and a complete articulated human foot. And the human foot was not hers. So there was an extra human foot in there. And male gazelle horn uh, was found in direct association with the basalt ball, and the basalt ball was under her pelvis. Um, and male gazelle horn cores have been found in other Natufian graves, and it might have been had some kind of spiritual use as well as a functional use of some sort. And this is the shaman burial. You can see she's lying here, and you have the extra foot here. You have a um, uh, the uh, forearm of a wild boar, eagle wing bone over here, marten skulls, fragment of the basalt ball would be over here somewhere. Um, then you have wild co um, cow's tail and you would have the gazelle horn and such over here. So um, you also have um, human dog burials. Uh, you have one at Ein Malaha. Um, uh, which is a probable woman also, and she was found among 12 other individuals, but her, but the puppy she was found with, which was around four to five months, um, is assumed to be hers or with her because her hand was resting upon the body of it. And this is one of the earliest archaeological evidence we have of dog domestication in the Levant. Um, there's also a human dog burial at Hyonim Cave, um, uh, of a man who is interred with two small dogs and both of these burials suggest that dogs lived around uh, and within the human habitations during this period. There is a fairly recent article uh, which I will share in the sources, it's a short article there, which discusses the possibility of using dogs for hunting during the early uh, to late Natufian period uh, with evidence from Shubeka, so the place with the bread. And here's the human dog burial from Aymalaha. Um, this is the dog over here. And this is the woman, as you can see, her hand is on here. Yes. And then the art of the late Natufian. It's more complex than in the early Natufian. You, it's very focused on animals and you have small figurines um, made from bone and stone. So instead of just uh, decorating, or just, but instead of decorating um, utilitarian um, tools and ornaments, you actually make figurines specifically. And one of the uh, almost no depictions of humans, though, um, and one of the few is the Ein Sacri lovers from one of the Ein Sacri caves near Bethlehem. And this is the earliest known example of two people engaged in sexual intercourse. Um, and there are different colored beads uh, we also find, um, and some seem to have been also part of an extended trade network. So here you have the Ein Sacri lovers, so you can see one human here, an arm, legs entwined, and the other human is here. So yeah, they're doing something. And then the late Epipaleolithic in the Sagros Mountains. As I said, there's not a lot uh, of work that has been done here. It's very limited and it dates uh, like it's a long time ago that this has been done. So the time period is the same, 13,000 to 9,500 BCE. Um, there's uh, ex it's an extension region and it has very varied topography. Um, there's different vegetation that has adapted to altitude, latitude, temperature, precipitation, and exposure. Um, during the Bulling Elowal, um, the landscape most likely remained very open. And cereals, cereals were more abundant, but people remained mobile and lived by fishing, hunting, and gathering. And gathering was focused on tree fruits. And the faunal sample, it includes gazelle, onagas, goat, sheep, red deer, cattle, and pig. And in the younger dryers in the Sacros Mountains, um, the trees were forced back into the refugia that they had occupied in the late glacial period. 
and surveys of the northern steppes uh, close to the headwaters of the Euphrates and Tigris valleys um, and in the mountain valleys of the Sacros, um, Sacros, Sacros, and the areas here seem to have been abandoned during this time. The main zone of settlement in the Yonge Dry is, is the foothills of the Sacros, and there are signs of greater investment in at the living sites and sheltered locations. Um, then you have small scale structures within caves and on platforms outside of caves. You have stone foundation for simple round or oval shelters. And at these sites, fauna is mainly sheep and goat, both morphologically wild, which means they were not domesticated. That was it for today with this lecture. I uh, hope uh, it was uh, good <laughs> and have a nice day.